Welcome back to Fight Night at our Cobra Kai watch party. I previously covered the LaRusso Man's Brawl and I want to step back and cover the other consequential fight of Season 3. That is the dual laser tag and juvie battle at the end of Episode 5 of Miyagi-Do. I will say I do think Episode 5 is the high point of Season 3 and this fight especially plays into it. Now as you saw this video is called Miyagi-Do at War. That's what we're focusing on and it's the key to why this episode is the best of the season. Namely that despite being called Miyagi-Do, it embraces everything Cobra Kai is about. Of course that doesn't mean Cobra Kai the dojo or karate. I'm referring to Cobra Kai the streaming show follow-up to the Karate Kid saga. The original premise was always to re-enter the world through Johnny Lawrence's point of view. Essentially we were flipping the script on Cobra Kai. That worked very well for the first two seasons. However, Daniel LaRusso and Miyagi-Do were still the same. Daniel was upholding what he learned from Mr. Miyagi. The beauty of the middle of season 3 is now the show's primary premise is applied to Miyagi-Do. We're flipping the script and Miyagi-Do isn't just about self-defense anymore. Miyagi-Do is going to war. That brings us back here, Sam leading an ambush on Cobra Kai and Robbie starting a fight with Sean. But then what is the lead up to this fight? It's the mid-season climax and is pivotal for the rest of the season. To understand the lead up to this split fight and why it works so well, we need to go back, but not to here or here, but instead here. Yes, thousands of miles away in Okinawa. What makes the dual fights compelling isn't that they're a culmination of a long buildup of plot, though they are. These three story moments are completely unrelated by plot and story but instead united by theme. That theme is the other side of Miyagi-Do, the side that must be ready to fight a war. It has always been there though Mr. Miyagi didn't like it and never taught it to Daniel, but thanks to Chosen, the door is open for Daniel and us to step through. The biggest key to the aggressive offensive side of Miyagi-Do is how Chosen originally describes it. Defense takes on many forms. That is an important point. Even the offensive side of Miyagi-Do, which Sato taught, but Mr. Miyagi didn't, is framed under the idea of self-defense. It only takes one side to wage a war. If someone is waging war against you, there is nothing you can do. Ignoring it will be your ruin. You must fight back. In the voiceover, Chosen explains the Miyagi ancestors were fighting Japanese invaders. Now back in the valley, our Miyagi-Do students aren't exactly facing that, but they do have their challenges. Let's look at them. We'll start with Robbie. Ever since he was first in Juvie, he had trouble with Sean. Notice Sean is the aggressor, the invader as it were. He goes after one weak kid, then focuses on Robbie. Now Robbie wasn't looking for a fight and even said as much. And karate's about self-defense. But Sean didn't care. Sean was asserting dominance over the new kid. It worked. Sean then proceeded to mock and push him further and further. The key moment though was here. Why don't you just leave me alone, man? That ain't ever gonna happen. He's making it clear. They may be locked up in juvie together, but they are not on the same side. This is war. You got lucky this time, bitch. Let's go. Now let's look at Sam and the other Miyagi-Do students. Obviously, they've had a beef with Cobra Kai carrying several episodes. What's interesting is the worst part of this beef is the beginning. Attacking Nate after the car wash is pretty low. Even if they did just want the money, they could have taken it and not Get the fucking shit out of me. Wow, he looks messed up. It's interesting to note that Sam invited the Miyagi-Dos and got Moon to bring the cheerleaders, but the idea of inviting Cobra Kai never even crossed her mind. I suppose the thought of extending an olive branch to the other side in the name of a common cause that is helping Miguel never occurred to her. This is actually consistent and in character for Sam, which if you've seen some of my other wonderful videos you're aware of. Not that Cobra Kai needed to jump Nate, I'm actually kind of curious what would have happened if they just rolled up and offered to help. Perhaps Sam would refuse, but Moon would step up and tell them to join. That sounds like Moon. Anyway, none of that happened. Even if Miguel still got the money, Nate got beat up and Sam reopened the dojo. There's an idea of mental consistency. Once you start down a path, you tend to stick with it. So when Sam brought everyone here, it almost made this moment inevitable. This is when Sam committed herself to fighting. Without realizing it, she decided they were already at war. 
It's worth pointing out if you look at Cobra Kai's actions over these next few episodes, everything they do is really decreasing in intensity. If attacking Nate was the worst thing they did, kicking the soccer ball into the model is a step down from that. Hawk's move here really isn't coming from some hatred for Miyagi-Do or desire to be a mean bully, but just old-fashioned jealousy. He sees Moon laughing and paying attention to Dimitri and he gets pissed. It's understandable. Moon is a hard girl to get over. Imagine what's going through his mind at this moment. Imagine the Moon he remembers, how wonderful she was, those tender moments together. Now you see that girl laughing it up with another guy over there? Don't even lie, you would kick the soccer ball at the table too. The problem is karate rivalries and jealous breakups don't go well together. Then later the running around and acting like jerks at golf and stuff is another step down in seriousness. It's needlessly being a douche for sure, but it's not like this kid can't just pick up the basketball and still shoot it. Plus Chris claims he almost got fired for this, but there's no way he could be responsible for immature high school kids stealing. If his boss did get mad at him, then maybe golf and stuff isn't the place to work. Now Sam's first attempt to fight back is at the soccer match. Honestly, her little speech here always struck me as a little strange. First off, lines like, Sides, let's game of soccer without a little physical contact. Sound more like she's talking about hockey than soccer. Plus, she's not angry or upset or even vengeful or spiteful. Look at her raise her eyebrows and slightly pulse her body. It's like she's flirty, flirting with the idea of beating up the Cobras. Contrast that to here. This is where Sam is in a very different mood. First off, she has a special pillow for when she lays on her bed while it's made. Seriously, this pillow looks like something my grandparents had on their couch in their living room that you were never supposed to touch. Weird. Anyway, her stillness is a good hint at a creeping depression. It's a feeling of hollow or empty, lost. The school gave her detention. Her mom shut down practice and reprimanded her. She can't win. Sometimes when you feel like you just can't win, you shut down, at least a little. That is happening to Sam. Then her phone dings and she springs into action. She calls all the Miyagi Do's together. Contrast this short scene with Sam at the soccer match. This is more laid back. She's almost enjoying her own idea. She's flirting with the idea of fighting the Cobras. But then here, she's fast, determined. She dismisses Dimitri's objections. Her mind is focused on this fight. She wants it now. The desire is all consuming. The difference from this to this, or even here, stems from Sam's emotional point of origin. Coming from a more empty or hollow or depressed state, it's easier to be filled with an emotion, any emotion really, but especially anger. It was very easy to set her off, and in her haste, she brought everyone else along. The fights themselves are pretty straightforward. Certainly the Robbie Sean Juvie battle is more exciting, mostly because of Tanner's insane amazing stunt work. That's pretty awesome. The Miyagi-Dos don't seem to have any sort of strategy or plan. They come in and Sam starts pushing and kicking. But look, despite the fact that she made sure they had a numbers advantage, Dimitri ducks away waiting for the right moment. While this could be effective to try and minimize his own engagement, it kills the team and neutralizes their numbers advantage. It's everywhere too. Look here, Chris is strolling through the arena. Where's the teamwork? Why isn't he helping anyone out? Again, isolating yourself neutralizes your numeric advantage and very clearly indicates poor planning and leadership. Even if he manages to avenge the honor of his mother, it doesn't change that he's there by himself and not with the team. In contrast, Robbie has a clear specific plan. He neutralizes the lackeys so he can isolate Sean. Once he was able to get Sean one-on-one, -on -one, he knew he would have a chance. He succeeded in everything he wanted. This is when the fight starts to go bad for Miyagi-Do. Tori and the other Cobras show up. Now this is a little strange. How did they show up so fast, already know what was going on? I do think there's a straightforward explanation. The Cobras were hanging out there and obviously were planning to make a day of it. This is a Saturday and they were likely at training in the morning and then hanging out in the afternoon and evening. So it makes sense Tori and the others were already on their way to meet up with Hawk and crew when Sam and Miyagi-Do's attacked. This is a laser tag arena, so it's probably fairly big. And at some point, Hawk or Mitch or someone sent her a quick text that Sam and the others were attacking them. Thus, Tori walks right in and is ready to fight. If you go to war, you have to consider the possibility your enemy may have reinforcements. 
Sam clearly did not. Also, since Miyagi-Do was spread out, it was now easy for Cobra Kai to pick off their fighters one by one. Now, Sam certainly didn't realize she would freeze up at the sound of Tori, though her reaction seems to indicate she never considered Tori being there in the first place. While it's not quite as bad as Danny forgetting about the Iron Fleet. While well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces, they certainly haven't forgotten about her. So Sam kind of forgot about Tori. It is a little interesting that she was so unprepared for it. The explanation, I would say, is going back to her emotional state. She went from a blank, hollow emotional state to a high. She was full of anger or desire for revenge. She openly said it was for payback. That blinds your judgment and is clear throughout this fight. She wasn't mentally ready for Tori and hid it in the props. The Miyagi-Do team suffered for it. There's a danger in going to war. You may win, but you may also lose. Losing will have consequences. I said earlier I don't think Hawk needed to break Dimitri's arm. A little judgment would show it wasn't the same situation as Miguel. But if the no mercy philosophy is to assure your enemies don't attack again, then you can see why it works. For the second half of the season, neither Sam, nor Dimitri, nor any Miyagi-Do wants another fight with Cobra Kai. But that's not to say it never works. Robbie's attack had far better results. He made a statement with Sean and perhaps they found a wee bit of respect for each other. There's been a theme in the show that standing up to bullies can work, that fighting them head on will force them to reevaluate. Maybe they don't want to risk another fight with you. This was very clear in season one with Kyler as multiple times he avoided Miguel after their fight. It's the same with Robbie and Sean. Now an argument can be made that Robbie was not following Miyagi-Do but Cobra Kai. After all, it was Kreese who told him to strike first. While Kreese's influence was there, it's still a stretch to call Robbie Cobra Kai. Instead, this is closer to an area where the two philosophies overlap. Robbie's actions are closer to what Chosen was teaching rather than Kreese, and that is the true lesson. Robbie found success where Sam and the others ended up in disaster. Robbie was closer to the going to war for self-defense lesson of Miyagi-Do. It brings us back here. Defense takes on many forms. Chosen explains that Okinawa was being invaded by the Japanese and they had no choice but to go to war. It's the lack of choice that is the key. If an enemy insists on war, then you take away their ability to wage it. Eh? That is when war is for self-defense. Now compare the two situations. Robbie is locked up in juvenile detention. He literally doesn't have freedom. In school, they may tell you to walk away. Just walk away from the bully. That makes sense, but what happens when literally you cannot walk away? That's what happens when you lose your freedom. The guards don't care. Maybe they even think you deserve it. This is Robbie's situation. Sean pushes everyone around. He picked a fight with Robbie on his first day. When Robbie asked to be left alone, he clearly said, That ain't ever gonna happen. You're always gonna be looking over your shoulder. This is what Chosen means when he says, if an enemy insists on war. Just like when Okinawa was invaded by Japan hundreds of years ago. You got lucky this time, bitch. Let's go. There is no choice. There is no escape. As a form of self-defense for himself and others, Robbie must go to war. It is true Miyagi-Do karate. Now what about Sam and the others? They've been getting pushed around too. A destroyed Lego set, detention, stolen stuffed animals, and apparently the final straw, a your mama joke. Tell your mama I miss her. Yeah, tell her stop calling me. But look at this closer. Their situation is not the same as Robbie's. Not even close. Destroyed science projects and stolen toys suck, but it's not the same level as this. Plus, most importantly, they still have options. They're not locked up with no freedom. What else could Sam have done here? She could have gone back to her mom. She could have called her dad. She could have found Chris's boss and told him what's been going on with Cobra Kai. Or another option, which I'm surprised is never brought up. She could have reached out to Miguel. Miguel was home from the hospital and she already unblocked him from Instagram and saw him in person. She could have texted him or called him or sent him a message. While it's understandable she doesn't want to bother him, it's also not out of the question. Besides, she knows Hawk is Miguel's friend. Perhaps instead of attacking Miguel's friend, she could give him a chance to help stop it. Not even to mention, after a full day of being rubbed down below the waist by some hippie loser guy, perhaps Miguel would like to see the girl who once mounted him for a kiss. 
The broader point is Miyagi ancestors had no choice but to go to war. Robbie had no choice but to go to war. Sam and the other Miyagi-Do students still had other options. They did not have to go to war. Thus, the Miyagi-Do lesson is you go to war only when you truly have no other options. Then it is a war for self-defense. It's worth pointing out this principle also applies to Daniel against Kreese at the end. He had no choice. He had to go to war. So that's a look at how Miyagi-Do flips the script and goes to war, where it succeeds and where it fails. A true lesson on what the requirements are for it to be true self-defense. Leave a comment and let me know what you think. After you like the video, be sure to subscribe. There's always more coming. Up next, I want to talk a little bit about Sam again. I made a promise to Hayden over a year ago and I need to keep that. I also have a breakdown of the house fight in the finale. Be sure to check that out. Check out my short video on Amanda's slap of crease, which was the result of Sam's big mess. Have a great day. I'll see you at the next watch party. Honk. <laughs> I'm glad you're having fun at my expense. <laughs>